Hi, short film fans, and welcome to the Cameo Launch Short Film Showcase. And if you're joining us from podcast land, welcome back to the Cameo Launch Short Film Podcast. I'm Nigel Morgan, and it's my honor to still be your humble host for our brand new season. We're super happy to be kicking off the second season of the podcast. And by we, I mean myself and the unstoppably charming yet irredeemably mischievous George Mole. Welcome back, George. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Loving the sort of adjectives and everything. All of you will be excited to learn that George and I are not the whole we. True to form for a show that barely manages to snag a second <laughs> season, we've expanded our sorted <laughs> cast to reach out to the cool kids or um, anyone. Um, <laughs> yeah. And to that end, we're delighted to welcome DJ G Funk himself, Nathan hey. Gardner, to the show. Welcome to the Madhouse, Nathan. How are you doing, guys? How are you doing? How are you doing? You know what? That was one of the best intros I've ever had in my life, <laughs> Nigel. The best intros. You you call me a cool kid. That's 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 yeah, still that's it. in history forever now. Um, if anyone ever tells no, me, no, no, that you appeal to the cool oh, kids. The cool kids. Oh, they, they look that's up to me. They look up to me. How yeah, you that's doing? what it is. Exactly. <laughs> I'm really happy to be joining you guys. It's really exciting. So. Oh, you know, first time. We're happy to that. have you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. Absolutely. It's like in the second film where they get a little bit more budget, you know, and they bring in a few more, like, a little bit more famous kind of. You're the star power, so take all these compliments as you can and let's let's have a good one. I always know that with the uh, star power that they bring in for the second season for The Hook, they also kill them yes. off after the first episode. So I'm, I'm, I'm just... Uh... <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. You know, no promises. See, you're going the other direction and you're going to end up being the Dwayne Johnson of this whole series. Yeah, I was literally about to say, you're going to be the rock. Going off, uh, <laughs> the I like that. I like yeah. that. I am the rock. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh God, which one of us is going to get killed off? Not it. Um... I suppose that all comes down to you know you know when I do my first review, depending on how you guys respond to my first review, is probably going to be uh, who who ends up uh, in the trunk of the car, as one. Yeah, might no, say. that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, we'll get the Tarantino trunk shot at least for the gram, and that will be about it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, is I mean, there any on. other way to die in a film than in the trunk of a car? No, you know, like hundred <laughs> percent. Well, given that uh, we've kicked off with a threat upon all our lives, <laughs> that's. Um... <laughs> Happy 2021, everyone. Happy 2021, exactly. But we've got a great episode to kick off the new season. We're going to be discussing Field of Vision short documentary, Church and the Fourth Estate. George is going to share his thoughts on the French-Canadian crime drama, I'll End Up in Jail. And Nathan will be leading our discussion on the Oscar-winning drama, The Silent Child. So if you haven't caught up on the reviews that we posted of those three films um, over this month, Go check those out. You can uh, find them on our YouTube channel and subscribe or follow at Cameo Launch on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. So those reviews give you a snapshot, but we're going to go into a deep dive on all three of those for this episode. First off, however, we need to talk current events. And while this will inevitably touch on coronavirus, we're starting to see signals that maybe, just maybe, we might be seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. So this past week, we've had an announcement from Cineworld that they are planning to reopen in England and Scotland on the 17th of May, the very same day that indoor cinemas will be allowed to open in line with the UK government's roadmap out of lockdown. Cineworld has also announced that it will be opening a limited number of its regal sites in America on the 2nd of April in time for the release of Godzilla vs. Kong and more sites on the 16th of April in time for the release of Mortal Kombat. This comes amid AMC starting to reopen some of its sites in New York and Los Angeles with reduced capacity. Although at the time of recording, there's no word yet from AMC, parent company of Odeon, as to when they'll be opening Odeon sites in the UK. Now, Cineworld's announced return comes amid a new multi-year deal struck with Warner Brothers starting in 2022 that will guarantee theatrical exclusivity for Warner Brothers releases for 45 days in the United States down from the traditional 75 days, and 31 days in the UK, down from 109 days. Although this can be extended to 45 days if a release meets an agreed-upon box office threshold. Now, apparently, this replaces the hybrid theatrical HBO Max or PVLD release strategies that we've seen from Warner Brothers, but represents a significant reduction in the theatrical window going forward. So we're clearly seeing the emergence of some of the lasting effects of COVID on the feature film market. But my question for the two of you, oh, my questions for the two of you actually, um, are number one, how long before we start seeing similar deals with other studios? Number two, 
how big a part will streaming services play in this? Nathan, as our newcomer, why don't you weigh in first? Right. I mean, this is an announcement that I saw come in a long time ago. I think we all kind of did. Um, th things were going to change. As soon as uh, the p pandemic started and they closed Cineworld, I knew that the influence was going to be lasting for a long, long time. Um, it's funny that we you, you connected the two questions together, especially with the streaming networks, because um, I don't think until a year ago, the content that they had on streaming platforms ever rivaled the experience of going to the cinema or even um, closely came to the level of, of, of film that you could experience. But with the pandemic, and I don't know whether it was a case of the studios panicking because they had this footage and these, this stuff that they had to get rid of um, and not knowing or being uncertain of the future of cinema. Um, and they thought, we'll just get it onto these streaming platforms. But what it's done is had the reverse effect whereby people are now not willing to go to the cinema or, or you know, or, or the cinemas don't, uh, it's not as appealing as it was before. So I think um, we're in for a, a huge change. I think there's going to be site closes all over the country. This game is definitely already afoot. Um, I think that it's now just being reported into the wider um, kind of financial areas um, that might be affected by this. So for me personally, I remember back in 2010, I think this was, it was both part of my business studies and then later I studied this again in film studies at college. But I remember in 2010 when, and again, obviously it's Disney because everything is owned by Disney, everything is Disney. But Alice in Wonderland, if you remember, in the UK, they only wanted it to play in the theatres and in the cinemas. For I believe something as low as, maybe even as low as 45 days, I'd have to look up the exact figures on that, um, before it came out on a Blu-ray release, because they weren't even sure with the first Alice in Wonderland film uh, whether they would make their money back or not. Disney weren't sure in the UK, even though uh, the, the original story is from the UK, but there you go. So that's what they did. So there was a lot of pushback at the time. I can't. I believe it was either Odeon or View who boycotted the film and wouldn't show it at the time. So it's maddening to me now that our sort of window of 109 days has now gone all the way down to 45 days that's absolutely crazy to me that it's gone down so low but it makes sense look with the pandemic well, 45 yeah. days if it's a success yes it, well absolutely yeah so yeah so what it can be less 31 days in the uk yeah yeah so yeah it's actually so sorry yeah so it's actually as low as 31 days yeah which it's i mean i get that and that's fair and you know box office is absolutely shot at the moment and they need to be able to take a risk and hopefully be able to keep films in there so giving them that sort of window it totally makes sense it's just a little bit depressing with obviously the history of cinema and sort of how it's gone but yes with the pandemic streaming services are going to pick up and are going to increase you mentioned there Nathan, about how like some studios and stuff are probably thinking what footage have we got what have we sat on which is most people's argument for why the Snyder Cut has even come to fruition and actually been seen by any of us is because someone went what's that massive thing that fans are willing to pay for that we can get rid of and then obviously they put it up for free on HBO Max anyway and Nigel and I have spoken about this at length before it was clearly as a giant net to capture as many people into HBO Max into Sky Atlantic uh, as possible and that's the future of cinema going forward and I'm not totally against it I want to go see Black Widow in the cinema on, I think, July, June 9th, but I also could watch it in my living room, pause it for the toilet and have as much alcohol and food as I want. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I'm positive about the future of cinema. If it's a hybrid of the two, streaming and cinema, then maybe that's just how it has to go. I mean, my, my, my whole thoughts on the whole premium video on demand thing is that it's only premium if there's cinema. If there's no cinema, there's no point. I mean, with America at the moment, um, they've been kind of limping through the pandemic with a limited a number a limited number of cinemas being open in certain states. And only in this past week, two weeks, they've started opening up um, cinemas in New York and LA who were the hardest hit um, by the coronavirus. And immediately you start seeing like a really significant rise in box office there. In the UK, on the other hand, it's just been done. It's dead. Like, no, nothing is open. So there's no... no um, cinema alternative at all as a result one of the films that's come out recently um judas and the black messiah um, i was really looking forward to in the states you have the option of if you're near a cinema that happens to be open you can see it there or you can watch it on hbo max um here it's straight to pvod and because there's no cinema alternative there's no incentive for me to pay the 15.99 to rent it when a few weeks from now, it's going to be thirteen ninety nine for me to buy and keep it. 
there's like no one's, and this is a film I actually really, really want to watch. So it, it, it depends on what the overall situation is. You still have to have cinema as part of the mix if you can have big film available in this kind of premium window. Otherwise, there's there's no incentive for it at all. I mean, even where you had um, sort of like Wonder Woman over Christmas and all that kind of stuff, it's still kind of in that premium space with the assumption that cinema will be back at some point, even if it's not around right now. And without that um, sort of push to watch it being driven by sort of like the online chatter and uh, the film communities that like to discuss these things in minute detail online, all that kind of stuff. Without that, I don't think there's much of an incentive to see it if there's no cinema alternative either. So I think regardless of what happens, I think we're going to see maybe a shift in the kind of films you see at the cinema, but not necessarily... I, I don't think it's cinema's definite by any stretch of the imagination, but I think there is kind of a seismic shift in cinema's relationship to um, yes. sort of premium premium content. I don't think cinema's dead. I don't think there's any way it can die. I think the way we view cinema is going to change. And that's an exciting thing as film fans, which we all are, as editors, which we are as well. That's an exciting thing. Zack Snyder's four-hour cut. I would go see that in the cinema with an intermission, but I'd also watch that at home. So if if in a weird way, like it always does, like the Renaissance as a whole was after, obviously, the Black Plague and everything and, and everything that's always happened, art, whenever there's, you know, sort of tragedy and, uh, you know, sort of a general sadness in the collection of life, the Great Depression and everything, that's where the best art comes from. So I'm still cautiously optimistic about what cinema will look like in the future. Oh, talk about the Renaissance. Oh. That's just classic. <laughs> classic. This is exactly why we need you, George. Um... <laughs> But bringing it back to short film for one second, yeah. though. So these attempts to adapt to the kind of post-COVID new normal, they filtered through to festivals as well. So pretty much all of the major festivals shifted to an online format, and many of them look like they're going to be keeping some kind of virtual element, um, even when in-person events are allowed again. So we've just published a, a great article from Lauren Goddard on this, um, on this subject, um, particularly around record viewership, due to online audiences at festivals like Sundance. Um, you can find it at cameolaunch.com slash reviews. Um, but with that kind of shift in the way um, festivals operate, do you do either of you think we're looking at a landscape where filmmakers reach might actually be extended by a hybrid approach to, to festivals or short film festivals? Yes, Nigel. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, even when you were talking about the shortening of days, I was like, this means now we're going to get more independent film back into the cinema because there's going to be a higher turnover of film and, and the, the levels are playing field out. I mean, film festivals online is, is, is a dream. Surely it's a dream. Absolutely. It's, 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 it's I've always wanted to, to go to Sundance. Yeah, me as well. I've, there's so many <laughs> festivals all around the world that I've wanted to go to. And sometimes you have to maybe get a, a copy on YouTube of a couple of the films, but you can't see everything that's that's entered and appreciate that. So I think that what it does is um, brings a whole new audience to the the model of what what happens at one of these awards or festivals. Because I think a lot of people hear about the Oscars, but they don't really think about what it's meant to be doing and what what the the concept behind it is, the celebration behind it. They just think, oh, it's about lead actor, best best film. They don't see all of the rest of the stuff that we see about the badass cinematography that's taken place. So I think that any film festival that's um, kind of brought to a wider audience, is, I, I see the same in theatre as well. The National Theatre put in their live shows on TV are just going to encourage more people to get involved in it because people don't have... It, it, like, if, if you go to the cinema and it's just those big box office Marvel films, you're never going to get to fully appreciate the art. So I think it's, it's, it's a great thing. I don't know if you guys agree with that, but, you know. No, I do, 100%. I think any chance to get more eyes in front of film, independent film as well, is going to, it's definitely going to be going in a positive direction. I think exactly what you say there about Marvel films and stuff like that, like we, we and they're absolutely fine, and you'll enjoy those Marvel films even more if on a Wednesday, let's say that's the cinema, or maybe it's your bloody front room, you're able to access new and upcoming films and get an idea of just the one 
wider market out there, be that foreign films, domestic or otherwise. I think that's beautiful. I like uh, when you touched on the Oscars there as well, Nathan, because a lot of people always argue, like a lot of my friends go, oh, it's just Hollywood, you know, thanking Hollywood for being Hollywood. Obviously, the same with sort of Sundance and festivals as well. It's like, oh, it's a load of sort of arty people telling each other, well done for your art. But that's the whole point. It's a lot more better when it's more accessible and we all get to see it and put our own opinions on it as well, which I think is just brilliant. There's a, you know, just because that film didn't win an Oscar, but it was nominated, it's still got a chance to be bloody brilliant film. So more chances for more eyes to get on that has got to be a positive thing. Um, well, what I'd pose, the question I pose is kind of a rebuttal to both of those points, is with so many festivals now um, engaging with online platforms and just kind of creating an online element, and also kind of given the massive upsurge of people subscribing to um, VOD platforms when the pandemic started, Netflix did more in its first quarter of 2020 than it did in the entirety of 2019. Um, and Disney Plus recently just passed the, the 100 million mark in terms of worldwide subscribers as well. Are we potentially looking at um, a certain amount of um, premium video on demand or video on demand platform fatigue? And if that fatigue comes, will it be people being fatigued by the Netflixes and Disney Pluses of the world, or will they be fatigued by all of these festivals or your movies or um, more sort of mid-range budget um, independent type films um, that, are, that are starting to come through? So, so the kind of stuff you find on BFI Play, for example. Personally, I think we are quite niche. We are actually quite rare, and I'm glad to see with these festivals going online that hopefully there's going to be a lot more fans and people like that, people who listen to this podcast, who are also going to be the same. But the fact that we go out of our way to watch short films uh, whilst they're still in the uh, in the award seasons and stuff like that, and at all these festivals, shows that we are quite niche in terms of film viewers. I think a lot the average cinema goer isn't going to be checking the BFI website to see what new, old, and, and new film is being uploaded. But we are, so that's great. That's just going to cause more attention, and it's, it's sort of going to bring up on that. But I think for the normal film goer. Yes, I think there could be fatigue. Absolutely. I think, I mean, we're on our second Marvel show now. Uh, what is it? Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And that's going very well. And that's like the first time, the second time Marvel have taken like their big budget films and stories and put it on the small screen on a streaming service. And we're watching it weekly. So it's feeling like classic TV. We're going to get, it's going to get stale. We're going to get more superhero fatigue. We're going to get streaming fatigue. And at the moment, Disney has only got themselves in that area. Netflix, at least, has got a lot more sort of documentary sides that they're pushing as well as their own independent stories, as well as films. And they've got a whole slate of films this year. So, yeah, I'm thinking by about halfway through the year, people are going to be a little bit bored and they're going to want to go to the cinema and see classic cinema again, proper big high budget, as well as independent, definitely. Yeah, George. Yeah, yeah, I agree with um, with what you're saying. I do think there is an all-round element of fatigue, though, that people are feeling with screens. And I do think the, um, the experience of going to the cinema is, is how they're going to have to pull us back in because I think people are stuck on Zoom or whatever they're working on and, and they're in front of their screen. They go, like you said, they access what feels like high quality date, um, like data information from their, their device. And that could be ITV streaming or BBC On Demand or wherever you want to go. And BBC have done such a good job of, buying in shows that are going to attract um, a wider audience. But I do think, I still do think that if the film festivals can make the film festival an experience, what they'll do is the same as things like, you know, when they did the broadcast of Coachella, everyone wants to go to Coachella yeah. and they did the, the homecoming. What it does is works twofold because people are going to go, oh, what's this? And they're going to see it. And yeah, they might only catch a bit or watch one. But the good thing about a short film is you watch three or four when they start rolling. You never, I mean, if, if you're, if you're, if they're streaming, you watch one, oh, you know what? That was great. I watch another one and another one. I've done on YouTube so many times and you just can't help it. You just kind of roll through. So I think that there is a capture element there and all they need to do is be smart with their advertising, and make, making sure people know that we do this in real life as well. And it is for everybody. And I think we'll see, just like drill music, a whole new wave of filmmakers come through because they'll just be seeing this and they'll just, they'll be like, oh, I can do that. It's on, it's just on the TV. Because if you think, when people think, oh, it's on the, in the cinema, 
I can't, that's bigger than I can do. But, you know, I can make, I made a music video. Yeah, I can, I can make something for the TV. I can do that. I can make something for YouTube. So we might see a rise in a different style of filmmaking again. Who knows? <laughs> well, well, we'll definitely be, uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that change in landscape. Um, I think it will be very interesting to see what kinds of release strategies filmmakers start using for short films, especially on the festival circuit going forward. I mean, we've already seen examples of Oscar-nominated shorts being made openly available on YouTube and other platforms. Also, we'll be doing a highlight on the Oscar-nominated short films in the run-up to the Academy Awards on the 26th of April. But shifting our attention to the short films that we've reviewed this month, we're going to kick off with Church and the Fourth Estate. So that is a documentary from Field Division and directed by Brian Knappenberger. So this film tells the harrowing story of a reporter who uncovers a series of child abuse allegations in Idaho's Boy Scouts of America. And one of those victims of abuse um, sets out on his own journey to, to tell his own story and reach others who had suffered similar abuses. Um, so this film, as I mentioned in the review I did, is obviously not an easy watch. But at the same time, it is something I think is very important to be aware of and to know what has been happening because aside from the obviously very serious issue of child abuse, you also then have the fourth estate, i.e. Um, news and journalism, doing what it's supposed to be doing, basically letting people know about the rot at the core of their, of their society. But the response to that is very much in line with this kind of rejection of of uh, inconvenient truths that uh, that we've been seeing in the last few years, that people kind of take on board their own um, their own internal truths, things which which are which make them feel better. They will believe whatever random conspiracy makes them feel better, or they'll believe whatever utter nonsense makes them feel better. And when in this case, you've got a whole community that's so embedded with this national iconic institution, the Boy Scouts, and the cultural ties, if not direct ties, to the Mormon church as well, and their complicity in allowing these terrible things to happen. I mean, there were so many allegations of people that had been uh, accused of of, um, of these types of crimes, and then they kind of get sanctioned and then thrown right back into circulation when they do it to somebody else. And when this is finally exposed, it's society itself that comes back on the the the, the journalists to, to punish them for, for airing this dirty laundry. It's, it's heartbreaking in so many ways. Uh, but at the same time, it's done so incredibly well that by the end of it, you've got, um, particularly with, 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 with regard to the, uh, the, the, the abuse victim um, who drives a, a core part of the story, you have people who are committed to actually making sure that the truth is known, irrespective of, how that affects other um, other people who wish it wasn't true. Uh, what did you guys think of the film? You know what? I watched um, your review, Nigel, and I think you summed it up perfectly in the word harrowing. Um, mm. I, I, I I sat down and I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> like I, I was expecting mm. um, glamour, but there, there wasn't glamour. There was a rawness to it that felt really, really invasive. Um, and I think that invasiveness definitely got me to understand the the core, like you said, protagonist, the the young man who'd been abused, or and also the journalist and the, the way they felt. And um, I I didn't feel like an anger; I felt like a sorrow. <laughs> and it was it was it was a hard it was a hard watch, definitely a, a great watch. But it was a hard watch. Um, yeah, that's 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 what I would say. I mean, is um, I, I I could have watched more. I wanted. It's, it's weird. At the end, I wanted a, a clear resolution. I wanted, I wanted mm. the the people at the top of the conspiracy to be brought to justice. And the fact that it didn't do that just kind of made you think how many people's stories haven't been told. And that was that was mm. a hard a hard um, message to leave on. I have to say. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with the both of you. Obviously, it's crazy that Nathan says that, like how you wanted... Did you say you wanted a, a clear resolution or did you want a clean resolution? What did you... I, I just wanted a... I wanted 
some sort of of yeah. resolution that, that yes. made me made me feel and, and and it's kind of ironic because the whole film yeah. is about the fact that the scouts are meant to be this wholesome good thing. Oh, no. And at the end you you're like, please let there be a wholesome good thing. At the end it's it's was it? yeah. 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 Mate, no, seriously, it's the fact that you just said that. I just I had to make a note as soon as you said that that you <laughs> wanted a clean resolution. This is how you know it's a documentary based on real mm-hmm. life. There's no clear resolution. The yeah. people in power who are corrupt are still in power. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's all part of it. I just, you know, I've said to Nigel already, and I actually had to text him this evening before we filmed the podcast to say, can you stop choosing films that are making me bloody cry? Because uh, it's really unfortunate. I wanted to watch your film, Nathan. I had to have a five minute break so I could clear my, clear my, my tear ducts. Um, it's so deep. Obviously, it's a really sad subject matter, but it's nice that it can sort of give that reaction in you yeah. as well. If I cry at the film, it's probably mm. good. I've always said that. But it's mm. so real because you know the interviewer has gone through it too. And because you know that straight away right at the start of the film every scene with him mm. in you are watching a man relive yeah. his own trauma do you know mm. what i mean it's a, like we the, there's being in the shoes of the director yeah. and the interviewer and it's them connoting what they want you to feel but i mean this mm. is this is totally different because you know especially because he sort of has to give the guy a hug at the end as well and they're both crying and they're both sharing their experience like come on that's the bit that's yeah. where real men cried yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah 100% yeah, yeah. yeah. but also yeah. i'll say one more thing i'll say as a film itself I think it's so like there would be roll shots in this film that wouldn't have been out of place in like some proper art house film. And mm. there's something so you said sorrow, Nathan. You said you know describe it in one word. Like Nathan says harrowing, you say sorrow. I say hopelessness. There's something mm. about all the shots of B roll showing these wide open snowy sort of places, and you can imagine, and it shows you that home footage: the kids running around, having snowball fights, having an amazing time. But it just has this sorrow of hopelessness because a child has been corrupted. And I just think you know. It's absolutely, you know, it's an impeccable documentary and it's definitely going to leave you wanting more, wanting a clear resolution, but also, you know, sort of thinking about it and being a little bit wary. I was so shocked by the stats at the end that it's 82,000 people in the Boy Scouts. Mm. I was a Boy Scout. I was in the Beavers, Cubs and Boy Scouts of the UK. And I can happily say that none of that nonsense happened over here, at least to my knowledge. So it's a shame that the Boy Scouts, effectively, as I said in the film, needs to be burnt to the ground. And I see they've gone bankrupt. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with you both. I'd say probably in the one area where I might um, disagree is kind of ending the film with a sense of hopelessness. I actually ended the film with a sense of hope just mm. because of the fact that, um, yes, the, the damage that has been done to these people is permanent. There's, yes. there's no shaking it off. Uh, but at the same time, they are each brave enough to return to... Um, uh, re- return to that trauma and face it and also not stop trying to move forward. They don't stop trying to look for other people. They don't um, focus on the trauma to themselves. They start looking to help other people and they very much can it, 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 without going too, too much into spoilers, I think where the film kind of leads you is that you've got these people that aren't going to stop trying to prevent things like this happening to other people or aren't going to stop yes. trying to expose the fact that powerful people will try and cover up misdeeds of other powerful people just to yes. hold on to power. Uh, but, you know, but you know, the, the fourth estate, as it were, doesn't get shut mm. down by that. And victims of abuse don't get mm. stopped by their abuser or by the people that enable that abuse. They keep mm. basically pushing forward to, to, um, to champion truth without sounding too corny that that is essentially what they do it's like look you can tell people what you want you can tell yourself what you want but this is what is true and i'm not going to stop trying yes. i'm not going to stop telling you what is true what is fact that this is wrong and if you're going to if you're going to be in the way then i'm just going to have to go through you and I, from that perspective i thought there was an element of hope to the film and i think it was important to have that because so much of it is just so Oh, one hundred percent. When you think of that happening yeah. to kids, it is just the worst thing. Yeah. Uh, so the fact it's, that they were awful. able to leave it there, I thought was 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 quite. Um, I'm not going to say uplifting, but but um, definitely left you with a sense that all hope is not lost. Absolutely. No, I agree. I think I think I think there were parts of the film that showed the hopelessness of such awful tragedies and such awful uh, activities happening with a child. But I think, yes, the end of the film actually showed you some hope in the hopelessness, which is quite 
iconic and quite important to be seen. This, 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 watching this short film, actually, I don't know if you guys have seen it, it reminded me of a fil- another film I did for film studies at college called Capturing the Freedmans, 2003 HBO documentary. I'm not sure if you can stomach any more documentaries. Uh, this one's an hour and 47. It's not a short film, it's a feature, but any more documentaries about child abuse. However, this one is absolutely impeccable and it's more about, again, covering up, but it's also about what truth is and who is truthful. And it all started because the director was interviewing uh, the clowns of New York. And then he suddenly found this rabbit hole in this story. And I won't spoil any more. But if you can stomach more stories about this, then I recommend that film as well. That sounds amazing. We'll definitely have a look at that. But let's uh, let's move on to our next film, which involves death, but is somehow more lighthearted. Um, George is going to kick off our discussion on I'll End Up In Jail. George, why don't you uh, take us through that one? Perfect. Yeah. So my film for this month is I'll End Up in Jail. It's uh, Maureen Savage, played by Martine Franco. Her escape comes to an abrupt end when she drives her truck. The director says monster truck, but I think it's just a normal truck. She drives her truck into a deadly car accident. Stuck in the middle of nowhere, she must share the company and the blame of a rather junkie dubbed Jelly the Loon. I loved this film. I thought it was absolutely beautiful and small. And as I mentioned in the full review, which you can watch on camerolaunch.com forward slash reviews, um, I thought it was just a beautiful, beautiful little film. It shows sort of escaping, taking one's life into their own hands. And it also shows a woman who her whole life has been used and abused by men. And she's finally given the chance when already trying to take control of her life. She's almost given another chance. Right when she thinks she's about to get sucked back into trouble, she's given another chance for retribution. Um, I think it's brilliantly done. It's a sort of black dramedy. So there's very sad moments in this film. But again, as Nigel just said, the way it touches on death is a little bit more lighthearted. There's definitely a lot more comedic moments to this film. And you're chuckling whilst also just being enamoured by the beautiful views of the Quebecian landscape in front of you. And I think it's, you know, I don't know if we've brought this quote out yet in 2021, but it is certainly a beautifully lensed film, I have to say. <laughs> there we go. There we go. It's um, Cameo launch bingo, guys. There it is. If we're doing a drinking game, uh, start now. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I'll end up in jail is, is absolutely impeccable. It's a master of show, don't tell. There's so many parts in the film where you're sort of being hinted at things and you're given an idea and it's put back on you as the viewer to interpret what you want, which is what all good films should do. It is a foreign film, so get your reading glasses on, get ready for reading subtitles. But I think it's, it's, it's absolutely impeccable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what, right? I, I, uh, I absolutely love that film. <laughs> It was amazing. I found myself like rewinding <laughs> like moments in it because I was like, is that real? Is that is that is that just happening? And also I, I couldn't let this like comment pass without talking about the either you guys gotta help me. Was it a dummy or was it um just amazing makeup on the cadaver? You know when she's uh, the, the the tree shot, the tree, yeah, the tree shot, yeah. No, we had the exact same thought process. No, I'm pretty sure that is an actual body. I would have to look at the behind the scenes to find out if that is a cadaver. Technically, on the edge of spoilers here, but yeah, they made there's a, there's a car crash in the film. Yeah, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, so there is a cadaver at some point. No, I actually think that's that's an actress. I can't tell. It's a great shot. It's a beautiful shot. It's my it's favorite bit. Shot. Yeah, it's a I wanted shot. Nigel to put that shot in the review, but unfortunately, <laughs> it is the most spoilery shot probably going. Yeah, yeah. I thought I thought it was really great. I agree with you. The storytelling, oh, it was it was something else. I love I love it. I love the the movement in it. It felt like you got like two hours in in 20, 20 minutes. It, exactly. It, oh. it was so quick. It was so quick. So quick. pacing wise. And, oh yeah, the the pace was and. and it allowed allowed for some breath, didn't it? But it, it just kept it moving. And then um, I, I love what you said about the uh, the landscape. Oh man, mm. there's some of those shots are just beautiful. Oh, that's that's the second one. They they did the film you was uh, reviewing as well, Nigel, in the snow, didn't they? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's like climate change. We don't get snow here anymore. No, no, exactly. no, no. But um, no, I I thought it was an absolutely outstanding short film. It's a prime example of the importance of the craft of storytelling yeah. um, in Brighton Screenplays, mm. because you essentially got a person's full character arc into this, was it 20, 23-ish 23 minutes, minute yeah. film? Yeah, 23. Um, the, the same length of character arc that you would get into a feature film, but they were able to do it in like 23 minutes. Now, yes, it is the longest, yeah. it's on the long side for a short film, but you don't feel that duration at all because it, as, as you said, Nathan, it keeps the pace going. 
um, but also gives you kind of time to breathe and time to reflect and everything. And it really gives certain twists in the plot time to land as well. It doesn't just speed you right through it. There's no plot overload, nor does it feel like it drags at any point. And um, it's another example of how important really solid acting is. Given that the whole film is in French, the fact that I had to read subtitles going all the way through didn't distract me at all from just like the little sort of micro expressions um, on yeah. on the uh, on the actors' faces, particularly particularly the leader Martin Frank. Um, she is phenomenal throughout this film because yeah. she has to get across being beaten down at the same time as being defiant, at the same time as being caring towards her son, who is an obvious screw up and and making some very, very um, impactful decisions throughout the course of the story as mm. well. She has to kind of channel strength when her whole situation is that she's just being beaten down and suppressed and bullied and all this kind of thing. You know, there's, there's just this constant um, struggle to yeah. be free and to be strong. And, you know, the, the, the arc that gets her there is brilliant. And the way that she portrays that character over the course of that arc as well absolutely fantastic fantastic and of course the uh, cinematography being outstanding doesn't hurt either no it's beautiful to look just, at just uh, excellent excellent work excellent work i noticed there's very little uh, or not not uh, very little by the way of um uh music score yes well, yeah i was gonna say that which i think actually works in its favor i don't know what do you think what do you guys think about that yeah, so for me, in terms of the music, I mean, that's obviously something that's prevalent. I've always gone on about on about how I, del even though Nigel sends me these films and a lot of them are on Vimeo, I will deliberately put them on the TV in the other room on my soundbar because I want to hear every single bit of that score. And I was actually kind of shocked, but it made sense that this film barely has any score at all. I think, remembering back, I mean, I watched it again earlier today, there's like some light violins, maybe even a harp at some point, just every so often, almost as... Like just just as a reminder, every so often, but that makes you sit in the visuals even more. Obviously, this is going to be very important in a minute when we talk about our next film when it comes to sound and music choice. But for this film, especially, you know, you're in this desolate, wild Quebecian landscape, and it's beautiful and it's silent. You can hear the wind in the background, some diegetic sounds, which they obviously ADR'd in later. And then when you do get a little bit of music, it's right on the twist halfway through, and it's right when we learn something at the exact same time as our lead character. And then this music sort of flutters in before right again at the end, the very last shot without getting into spoilers is a comedic one because of the music that Smash cuts in when it comes to the credits. Perfectly done. Perfectly done. Another fantastic short film. And moving swiftly into our final film, The Silent Child, the Oscar-winning drama. Nathan, you you reviewed this one. What were your I thoughts did. on it? So The Silent Child um, was directed by Chris Overton and it um, starred Rachel Shenton, who actually wrote it as well. And it's about a profoundly deaf girl and her journey to being able to fit into society or not. Um, the The film is a British sign. It's, it's, it's a British sign language film. So it's, it's subtitles or captions, uh, I'd call them, uh, throughout the film as well. Um, and we basically see some sort of Rocky type um, development of a profoundly deaf girl into learning how to do sign language and, and her family engaging with her. Um, so it's a beautiful film as well. I think that um, the the music and the sound plays a massive part throughout the film. Um, and for me, even though um, Rachel Shenton plays the uh, social worker, Joanne, I think that um, Rachel Fielding takes the biscuit as the mother of the profoundly deaf um, daughter. I think her um, her responses and her, her acting and, and the way that she portrays the character sets the whole story up. I, I think that if we if we didn't have her um, kind of lack of empathy or um, just the, the without giving too much away without the situation surrounding, um, I think that we would not have an understanding of the conflict. Um, and I think because it the the film kind of ends at the point where it the journey really begins um so it's kind of like a prequel in a way because you could expect a, a film starting from that point it's called the silent child expect it to start from that point but this shows the the, the pre-development which um rachel shenton was really clear that she wanted to show to an audience um, she said that um her father 
went uh, profoundly deaf in his later years. So she had to learn sign language as an adult to be able to communicate with her dad. And the journey that she went through, she wanted to share that journey and, and, and get everyone to understand the importance of the fact that being deaf is not a disability. It is just a, um, a kind of obstacle rather than yeah yeah it's it's it's, it's not a, a way of living so she wants british sign language to be championed which is pretty much why she put the film together especially in schools yeah yeah no i, I think it's it's brilliantly put together i think the the on a meta level what what motivates the film is the most noble of motivations and i think the where where the film chooses to leave the story as well I think kind of spurs the audience to action also because you know you, you see where the story comes to an end and you're like okay so how do we fix this and it's not kind of left as a kind of esoteric wondering of oh i wonder what it would be like to be x or y it's right this is a real problem a real situation this is something i can maybe do something about this and i think that's probably one of the strongest things about this film um and also i think i'm really quite impressed that it um had nathan you alluded to this as well um a sort of underlying issue within that family within the story because as the as the story begins you very much get the impression that this is a family that just doesn't care about this kid and you're like you know they they seem like otherwise good people they seem you know educated they don't seem cruel but it's not so much that they don't care. It's, see, it's almost like they've given up. And again, you'd think, well, why would you just give up on a kid? I mean, especially one as like little cute as, as Maisie Sly is. But um, as the story kind of goes on, you realise that there are other issues that contribute to what you see going into the story. And I think it's important to include that because if you just had just a mean family, that actually kind of takes away from um how grounded in the reality you can actually become because you know you wouldn't have a deaf child and then just go like that will allow you you can sit in front of the tv while we all have breakfast together yeah you know there, there, there has to be a a reason why um uh the, the the family dynamic is the way it is and i think it does a good job of making those things clear without derailing the, the eight do, do you think though, Nige, can um, I just interrupt and ask a question? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's probably something you can answer yeah. as well, George. Um, yeah. I watched the film and I was like, yeah, that's that's the point. That's the review. And, you know, I, I, see, I see where they wanted to go with it. But I think that in a sense, those elements were simplistic to think that she had siblings and none of those people were interested in learning because all of a sudden yes. they pick up an interest in learning British Sign Language. And I think that... That's almost a mm. trick that they missed. Um, and they obviously they had the short amount of time to try and tell that story. But do you think yeah, that yeah. the rest of the family should have had the same kind of outlook as Rachel Fielding? Because they seem very, it, they, they make them seem preoccupied, but she is still a member of their family. And, and even setting it in suburbia, uh, you know, we, we the great shot of both of the BMWs on the drive. Yeah, we get it. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, was, it was it was these problems happen um, for rich people as well. You know, yes, like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But what what do you what do you think about the the not not so much the casting? I thought the casting was great, but maybe sure. the performances within the family and 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 helping push the the narrative to uh, of the audience. Yeah, it kind of feels a little bit like, you know, when you find out that a feature film used to be a short, this feels like those underdeveloped uh, sort of plot lines and characters, and they are developed, I just think, because they're not as important to the core story we're trying to show, they are slightly underdeveloped in that regard. There's the brother who's a bit embarrassed because, he, you know, he's, he's obviously attracted to and fancies the sign language teacher, the, the lady who comes in. There's the sister who's always really busy, and she's the classic kind of sarky little sister making comments. She's making you laugh within the first 30 seconds of the film. They, they serve a purpose. But I think in the feature film version of this film, they would be a lot more valid. They probably would get more interested. The fact that you showed the family getting interested, I think, if anything, was supposed to be a juxtaposition to sort of the, without getting into spoilers, the sort of father and mother point of view. I think, if anything, showing that the children actually are interested and are involved and they're excited and they're like, oh, that must mean that our younger sister wants orange juice. I think, if anything, that's supposed to make the film as a whole uh, sort of resonate with you more because you see that the kids 
would be involved, would be interested in sign language. And if that's what, you know, the next goal for the family is to be, then they would be down for it as well. But as it is in every family, it's down to mommy and daddy to make that decision from the top down. And that's the same with why I believe that this film should be shown in all schools so that we can make that change from the top down from schools as well. So everyone can be more aware of deaf people and the importance of sign language. So I think if anything, I'd like to think, and this might be putting way too much credit on the directors and the writers, I like to think that's a deliberate choice. No, I, I 100% agree with you, George. I think, yeah, yes, you're hamstrung by the fact that it's a short film and you don't have a lot of time to spend with the supporting characters. And the two main um, scenes in which you see them, the first time they're quite disinterested and the second time, you know, they're starting to pick up on, on certain things. I think it's less that the, the kids don't care and more about the fact that they're teenagers and teenagers have a tendency to be a bit self-involved. And, you know, they've got, you know, their own stuff going on at school and exams and all that kind of thing. And also as kids, if the parents have seemed a bit detached, detached from um, uh, the, the needs of, of this, of this child of, of Libby, um, then they'll pick up on that as normal to a certain extent, as long as if they don't perceive harm is being done, then they won't necessarily make steps to understand if if what's been um, ingrained into them is that you just can't read her and she prefers to watch TV, then they just let her watch TV. So once um, uh, once the social worker comes in and she starts to learn sign language and those lines of communication start to open up, they do engage. And you know, I think it's it's important to show that transition with them, although you can't go through. Uh, a sort of nuanced journey with those particular characters since the core of the story is supposed to be the, the, um, Rachel Shenton's character and Macy Sly's character forming a bond over this over this new language. And then just kind of going back to the um, the sort of B plot and the, and the underlying issues within that family, I think the fact that they kind of layered that in as not being a um, an issue-driven um, plot point is and that's very much a character driven thing. Um, I think is really quite interesting because it shows different um, different aspects of character which can affect a central core issue as well. Because obviously it leads to certain decisions being made which um, leads to the to the conclusion of the film. So I, I, I think the way the characters were, were portrayed, it can come off as not necessarily being realistic, but purely because of the time. Um, but in terms of their overall journey i think it's 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 a it's a good journey that they're that they're sent on as well yeah, yeah. they use some really nice um lighting techniques throughout the film especially mm. with their filters and uh, they, they the, the classic mm. it starts off dark and ends up light you know with the, <laughs> the i was gonna say that. And, and the montage is all mm. pinky and dreamy and the, the montage british, is amazing the british sign language under the tree like the kindle <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's the poster of the yeah, film yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As soon as they said they were gonna, I was like, it's an English film about sign language, and the fact that it's an English film and it, there's a child in it, they're gonna feed the ducks. As soon as she said, "Do you want to go feed the ducks?" I was like, "Of course she does. Of course she does." It's England. What else is that's, there to do? What else to do? <laughs> but but right, feed the ducks. Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. No, it's, it's it is it is a lovely film, and it yeah. knows it's a lovely film. And it knows exactly what it's Absolutely. doing. It knows what its message is. It knows when to touch on your heartstrings. We all know a photo or a shot of a girl looking at her family and you see from yeah. her point of view and it's muted and you can see her family are laughing or talking. And she's just, it's not just that she's not involved. She's just not there. Mm. She's literally in another planet no. because she cannot hear and she yeah, cannot yeah. get involved with the world that her family and everyone else lives in. And that's why this film's mm. so important because the sign language from the, the, the instructor, from the lady, shows, it's, it's almost like that's her only connection to the real world, if you really break it down in that way. And I just mm. think that's that's beautiful. And also, I think it's, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to draw a direct line from this film to this year's um, crop of, of Oscar-nominated mm. shorts, but we're now seeing... Um, among the nominated shorts, um, a film called Feeling Through, which has, which is the first film to have a deaf blind star in it as well. And, you know, the fact that you had films like this coming out and now you have um, films like Feeling Through, I think there's starting to be a bit more of a, a push towards having people with um, 
with these kinds of, of obstacles yeah, and telling people. stories from their perspective and actually having people from those communities take part in the telling of those stories yeah. as well, I think yes. it's huge. And the more that can be done, the better. And not, not just in terms of drawing attention to an issue, but to including yes. other people in the storytelling culture of cinema that have up to this point been been excluded from the conversation just by by certain now it's time to make it make it it we're way past time yeah. um for us to make the kinds of films that draw people into that and and the fact that this is now oscar nominated i think is, is fantastic. so I, I had a question based on exactly Beautiful. the points you ended on there that's what i was gonna say i, I agree yeah so um the the film um was made yeah. by slick films and we had one profoundly deaf um actor in there and the film was about her being profoundly deaf wouldn't it be refreshing to see more films about people with disabilities that aren't just solely about their disability? Their disabilities, <laughs> yeah. Yes, one hundred percent. I think I think the the one thing we can expect from the human race is baby steps when it comes to things like these. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the fact that they're doing these films at all, I'm going to consider that a win. But Nathan, I think you're one hundred percent right. It'd be great to have yeah a superhero movie with a deaf person in it who just happens to be deaf or uh, a blind person who just happens to be blind and that's uh, that's just Fair part of who right. they are that's Fair just part of their sure. life but it, the story isn't about that's it. that that's it that is yes it. but that, that is, is it. it you know i think it's not but yeah. you know films like these are a stepping stone to to that end 100%. so I, it's I, not I, just... I strongly believe it will get there as long as people are willing to keep telling those stories yeah I think they are. For me, it's not just about, oh, let's have a superhero film and this person happens to be disabled. We need to show less able people. It turns out when we're reflective of who we are at the human race at every point in history, everyone feels a lot more included. Imagine that. But one thing that's really important for me is, I don't know if you guys have seen Sex Education, but in season two, there's a, a, a disabled uh, char uh, character and actor played mm. by a quadriplegic wheelchair uh, mm. actor. And what they've done without getting into too much of spoilers is he's not the nicest, most amazing person in the world. Because funnily enough, when you go through such a... You know what Nathan knows what I'm yeah. talking about. When you yeah. go through such yeah. a change yeah. in your life, because he was once an abled person and then became disabled, you're not necessarily mm. going to be the nicest person in the world. This character isn't no. necessarily a villain, but this character definitely has some qualities to them that you wouldn't normally expect. Normally, you know, people wouldn't even touch these subjects mm. with a bars pole. So I'm glad we're, one, mm. getting these That's stories right. out there and being more involved, but two, showing that, look, at the end of the day... Some of us all have the capacity to be nice and some of us still have the capacity to be an arseholes regardless of how abled we are. And let's yeah. tell every story. That's, That's why right. I think. Agreed. And he is a villain. He is a villain. I don't care what Spoilers. you say. He's a, he's a villain. <laughs> Mabel, they deserve to be together. Yeah. Mabel, yeah. Mm. Oh, that's what's gone over my head. I haven't actually seen it all yet. But, it. Uh, it's on my to-do list as, as many things are. But uh, yeah, guys, those are our three films. Um, as we said before, you can catch the reviews that we did at cameolaunch.com slash reviews. Um, our reviews also have links to the films themselves, so you can catch all three of those films via our reviews. So please do do that. As this is the first episode of season two of our podcast, then we're going to send you over to cameolaunch.com slash podcast. There you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, iHeart, and a bunch of other platforms. So please head over there and get involved. We are going to be, as I mentioned before, pushing towards highlighting the short films that have been Oscar nominated. So you'll have a chance to get a better idea of what those films are, what they're about, and what our thoughts of them are ahead of the Academy Awards on April 26th. Um, we'll also be keeping you up to date with news from across the short film feature film independent film and cinema uh, industries so please do stay tuned if you head over to cameo launch and create your own account then you can receive notifications each time we post a new article new review uh, or a new video you'll also be able to leave comments on the reviews that we post as well if you want to stay in touch with us via the socials then you can grab us at, at cameo launch on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Head over to YouTube as well and subscribe and hit the bell to make sure that you receive notifications of each new video that we post. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. George, Nathan, thank you very much. Nathan, um, how was your first go around at a, uh, a Cameo launch podcast? 
Do you know what? That was absolutely amazing. That was so fun. I was, like I said, when I came on, I was a little bit nervous. I was like, these two, they've, they've got their backgrounds and their microphones in. Mine's just a, <laughs> mine's just a cardboard prop. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is when he leans fun. back and pushes over a fake set. <laughs> 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 that actually be more impressive. You actually had a whole yeah, it would. Like, you could just yeah. push over like Mission yeah. Impossible style. Yeah, was, that's big yeah, and it's like a whole warehouse, like an airfield kind of length. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> now from an outside view, Nathan, mate, you you have smashed it. It's been a pleasure having you I appreciate on. That, man. You know, I appreciate that. Appreciate yeah, that. It's, it's nice to have a, a, a buffer other than just my constant ramblings and Nigel trying to keep it back on track. Now it's not just my fault, so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to hear some more Nathan's rumblings, Nathan, where can the people find your social media? Work? I am on uh, Instagram mainly, uh, Nathan underscore G at um, no Nathan underscore G. Another accident. That's that's it. It's pretty long. George, how's it being back? Have you missed it? I have missed it. It's been wonderful to talk to you and rant and rave about current films, short films, old films, every kind of films. We've got the Oscars coming up. Um, I'm excited for more and more film this year. Um, it's been a pleasure being on this as always. Looking forward to the next one. But as I said, Nathan, it's been a pleasure having you here and uh, looking forward to doing some more ones as we go on. And if you want to follow me and hear some of my rantings and ravings, every time I watch a film since lockdown last year, I put a IMDb poster of it and a, a rating on my Instagram. And there's a little, I don't know if it counts as a reel, but I have underneath my photo, if you follow me at Georgie Mole, um, I can accept you. I'm currently on private at the moment, but that's at Georgie Mole with just an extra G E in the middle, not a Y as some people think. Um, and you can click on films and see my sort of reviews if that's something you're interested in. Excellent. So uh, guys, make sure you follow both of them. They have some awesome, awesome stuff they're posting right now. Also, if you're looking for some film-related merch, please head over to cameolaunch.com slash shop. As we keep mentioning, we've got books, movies, box sets. Um, you can get box sets of Akira Kurosawa films, Jean-Luc Godard films. We've got the screenplay for The Trial of Chicago 7. Uh, we've got the, the screenplay for Tenet. We've got a whole bunch of stuff on there. So pick up a few bits and bobs for yourself or for the film lover in your life. Our next episode will be an interview with the director of He Took His Skin Off For Me, Ben Aston. So do stay tuned for that one. Uh, until then, you'll stay safe. It's goodbye from George. Bye, everyone. Stay safe. And it's goodbye from Nathan. See you later. Thank you for having me, guys. And it's goodbye from me. You all take care. See you next time. <laughs>